Good morning. This is Kathy Bush, and welcome to the Dandelion Medical Webinar, The Impact of the Environment on Infant Health. We're so pleased this morning to have Kathy Randall as our faculty presenter. Kathy is a neonatal nurse practitioner and clinical nurse specialist with 20 years of NICU experience. She has a passion for many things from neonatal neurology to the NICU environment and beyond. Kathy has taken her health advocacy work to new heights and was recognized for her work on greening hospitals and homes by the Breast Cancer Fund in 2010. She is an international speaker and consultant, and today she'll share with us a little bit about the health risks in the NICU environment and beyond. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you so much for the um, nice introduction, and I'm excited to be with you all today and sharing some of my really kind of fun things that I don't normally get to talk enough about in the NICU. So I'll start with my disclosures. I'm not being paid for this presentation, but I do have existing royalty um, and other consulting agreements and stockholder relationships with several companies that do deliver um, products to the NICU. I'm today not going to be sharing any off-label or investigational uses of medications or devices, and I'll just give full disclosure that all my images are just stolen straight off of Google, so um, I hope that you enjoy it. I guess one disclosure that's not on here that I always forget to say on a Friday is that Friday is my gardening day, and my dog sometimes likes to have a little bark if he shows up, so hopefully we'll all be good. So we're going to start just with the objectives, and the objectives are really to describe three ways that newborns in particular are exposed to harmful chemicals. We're going to talk about some characteristics that make them particularly vulnerable, as well as some ingredients, uh, some examples of some ingredients that may pose risks um, not only to fetuses, but also to newborns and honestly to really all of us. So I thought it's always good to start with just the beginning of a a bit of a definition, a definition about environment. And when you look it up in the dictionary, these are some of the words that, that come up or some of the um, descriptions. So the environment is really the aggregate of surrounding things, conditions, and influences. So I think oftentimes we talk about environment and we don't always really think about the true impact that the environment, that word, the environment really has. Um, it's all the external factors that surround us and affect us every moment of every day. And the interesting and kind of fascinating part about the environment is that as you move through the environment and as you go from your home to work or from work to the gym or from one location to another, traveling and taking on the environment of other places, you take on literally a part of that environment. And the environment can even go as much as to be the social and the cultural forces that shape the life, each of our lives. Um, and again, as you travel, you, you're exposed to cultures and to social experiences that you wouldn't have if you had just stayed at home. So I think that the environment is so much more than just that single word that we oftentimes just throw around. The other piece that we're going to talk a lot about today is health. And the WHO, or the World Health Organization, defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. So this is not just the absence of disease. And so again, really thinking about that wholeness of the being and not just disease. So when we put those two words together, environment and health, more than, oh gosh, 24% of the burden of disease, most people think, comes from public health or environmental risk. So environment has a huge impact on our health. So these things in the environment have a variety of names. And because we're going to be talking about babies today, we're going to talk about these kind of five or six things um, throughout the, the day. So tetratogen, carcinogen, asthmogen, obesogens, and mutagens. So because we're talking about a developing human being or in a developing organism, these are all chemicals or substances that can change or alter normal development. And of course, with our babies, we're really concerned about this. And there might be a few on here that you're not really that familiar with, like the word asthmogen. 
So recognizing that there are now things that we can now identify in the environment that are triggers for causing the disease asthma. Things like obesogens, so foods, types of hormones, things that we're exposed to through cosmetics that actually alter our metabolic processes and make us at risk for obesity. So when we talk about this environmental health and chemical risk, these chemicals that we live in, this chemical soup of our, of our world, we want to become familiar with this term called the body burden. And the body burden is the, by definition, the total amount of chemicals that are present at any given point in time. And each person, each human has a unique chemical load. And so I think this is important as I was talking about environment and how, how our environment has this amazing effect on us. At the same time as this effect on our kind of maturation and our experiences, as we move through the environment, our body burden changes as well. So when I go to an airport or if I go to a new city, I'm exposed to whatever is in those environments and those chemicals that I come in contact with through the water, through the food, through the air actually become incorporated into my body and it changes my unique chemical load. So from day to day and from week to week and year to year, uh, it is um, it is really important to think about that this body burden is constantly changing. So babies, and we'll talk a little bit in a few seconds about why babies' body burden is a little bit different and unique. So what is the current evidence of body burden and chemicals? Well, for sure, all of us will recognize that exposures to chemicals, this body burden, begins early, and it comes from a number of sources. And I became familiar with this report by the CDC in 2009. And I don't really ever update this slide because I, it reminds me of how uninformed I was at this point in my life. And this was at, at the time, the fourth report on human exposure that was published by the CDC. And this is basically a report on human exposures to environmental chemicals. So I always find it interesting that the CDC was very well aware that there were these environmental chemicals that were causing disease and, you know, issues, health issues, and that they had known about it for so long that even in 2009, there had already been a fourth edition of this report. So the problem is extremely common and really well known, but I think, again, in healthcare, maybe not as well known as maybe it is for other sectors. So what are these? environmental chemicals that they were looking at. Well, in this report, what they identified was that there were 212 chemicals in each person. And these chemicals come from our daily living. They come from our telephones, from our cookware, from our foods, from our car. They come from all, from all walks of, of life and exposure. And there are really three main routes that this um, exposure happens. It starts first by going in us, second, by being placed on us, and third, by just being around us in our environment and in, in the air we breathe. So what do these chemicals do? Again, they're mutagens, carcinogens, they're neurotoxic, neurotoxicants. Um, they are damaging chemicals to our health. So we're going to talk through some of these risks in more detail um, and then just try to give you at least a um, little overview to all of them. So chemicals are unavoidable. We will all acknowledge this. There are nearly 100,000 chemicals that are used in modern life. Um, but we believe, I believe, that you can learn about these chemical exposures and then do our best to minimize these exposures through a variety of ways. So being in, in the NICU and working in the NICU, we all are aware that babies are particularly vulnerable. And so I think that that really it boils down to two main components, and I'll dive a little bit deeper into these. But basically, it, de it derives from the fact that their body is still developing rapidly and that their defense systems that you and I use every day are actually incomplete. So it is very... Um, obvious that then babies would have a have more vulnerability to these chemicals than than you and I do. And they have some unique exposures. So transplacental. So 
babies, fetuses as they're developing, they have met many opportunities to be exposed from their mother, from what mom does every day as her daily living, to um, to to share those exposures with their baby. And there are many lessons that we've learned from the past that make us really clear now that maternal exposures do matter. So as we think about this baby, a baby in utero, a developing human, and their link to their mom and to the umbilical cord, we know that things pass across that, that barrier, that it's not impenetrable. It's not a protective layer. There are many things that can get into the infant and affect their development. So there are lessons we can learn from the 60s, from other parts of the world where we um, saw that pharmaceuticals that were taken early in pregnancy and throughout pregnancy deemed to be safe at the time exposed more than, more than I think it's almost 10,000 infants and fetuses to harmful effects, mutagens, and later other medications, carcinogens. So we know from from these very real examples that that the that the placenta does not protect the baby from everything. We also know that because infants are reliant on on us to feed them, um, and especially with with um, our obvious desire to in, improve the rates of breastfeeding. Whatever, again, is in the mom has the potential to pass through the milk. And so we should educate moms about toxins in their environment, and we're going to talk about several, so that they can minimize that passing to, to others. And they, the animal milk in a community, so in other parts of the world, they can look at goats and sheep and cows to get a sense of what the actual body burden of environmental contaminants are. And so milk being a body fluid is really one of those markers of overall contamination in the environment. So morbidities are rare, even in the places where high environmental contamination of breast milk exists. Um, and the best that we can do is just really decide for that risk benefit is saying that, you know, breast milk is the most nutritious. It is by far one of the safest things that we can give to our babies, but we can try to do even more by making it even cleaner. So breast is still best. And in the NICU, this is just an unavoidable, uh, or a, you know, an unavoidable problem that, that moms are going to have toxins in their breast milk, but that we believe that breastfeeding is still the number one choice and that we should, again, just educate moms about the toxins that I'm, I'm going to share with you. So. Babies also and children, small children, have unique exposures, and this is just based on their developmental stage. So they have exploratory behaviors. Everything goes from hand to mouth. So when things are on the floor, when things are fall on the ground, when you know they pick them up and stick them immediately in their mouth, um, when they're able to pull to stand or they're in daycare situations, there are stature issues. They're they may stand, but they're still closer to the ground than the adults in the environment. And so on the ground is where all of the heavy metals accumulate. It's where the soil and pesticides, that's where they accumulate. So even with the most rigorous cleaning, though they're gonna have more exposures than than we do as adults. Um, certainly that, that plays to taking your shoes off when you come inside because you're not tracking in those env environmental contaminants um, if you have small kids or even pets at home. Um, so just recognizing that just part of their developmental phase makes them more at risk for these chemicals. They have high size and surface size to surface area ratios. So you can see here that their body mass as it gets less, their skin surface area decreases, the ratio gets less and less. So babies by weight are going to be have a higher um, rate of exposure and absorption through their skin. It's always, the skin is always our largest organ, but when we're talking about exposures, we want to just really recognize that the skin is such a, to body mass, is a really high um, exposure risk. And 
This is important when we talk about body care products. This is important when we talk about adhesives. This is important for a lot of reasons, but just recognizing that even small doses that would be the same for you and I because of their body mass are going to be far more concentrated. And so we need to think about that concentration and the impact that has. So they have some unique physiology. So we've talked through some of kind of their unique situations, their um, kind of unique body style and, and kind of where they live in the world, but also they have unique physiology. So number one is that they are growing massively. And so when they grow, they're using more energy and more oxygen and more water, and they need to be fed a lot. Um, babies eat every couple hours. We can go many hours without eating. Um, babies can't. So just that, that exposure, again, over and over, um, just is increased because they need more food. And then absorption, because they are actually growing so much, their body actually absorbs more than you and I do. So for example, if we were to look at a same similar dose of lead, a baby would absorb about 40% of the lead dose, whereas an adult might only absorb about 5%. So their absorption of nutrients to just foster that um, growth um, and the reason why they do that with lead is because lead follows calcium. And of course, there's a lot of bone growth happening. So it's just one of these things. They're just kind of in this unique physiology, this unique, unique part of life that just makes them more at risk. They have immature elimination and detoxification. We know that their livers and their kidneys are not as fully functioning. Even a full-term baby is not as fully functioning as an older child. And distribution. These chemicals, when they're in the body, they can go lots of places. They can, they have a weak blood brain barrier. They have low protein binding. And so more chemicals can get to places in the body than they can at other times of life. I think another interesting um, piece about this unique physiology, we talk about just their increased oxygen and, and food intake, but just to really think of it in, in things that we maybe think about every day is in minute ventilation. So if we look at minute, minute ventilation per kilo of body weight, you can see that babies and infants have three times the minute ventilation of an adult, and even a six-year-old has double the minute ventilation of an adult. So that doesn't really mellow out until they're much, much older. And so if you have air quality issues and you're breathing more rapidly and your body is smaller, that same air quality is going to have a huger effect on you as a baby than it would an adult. Um, so it's just important to kind of even think of, of those just very simple little physiologic differences. Of course, we know that baby's skin is thinner, which makes it more, uh, you know, more able to absorb um, anything that we place on it. Um, and that just places them again at risk. And this goes back to the, um, just the whole body weight ratio. So uh, the other piece about this unique physiology is these critical windows of development. And we've got babies who are going through massive, especially fetuses, right? Going through massive organogenesis, neuro, um, neuronal development. And, you know, that whole other lecture, I think I even talked about part of that on my previous webinar I did for Dandelion. Um, as well as endocrine system, so the hormone system. So all of these things are happening at a really critical time in life. And we now know that influences that happen in fetal life, um, transplacental things can, can influence our risks for later disease. So I, I think it's really interesting to be thinking about just how vulnerable these babies are. This is probably a, um, a slide that you've seen in some other um, presentations over the years, but just looking at the baby's development and just thinking about, you know, all of the organs and all of the formation that's happening, functional morphological changes. And then this is an example that's actually from UCLA that talks about the timing of air pollution and whether or not that's going to have an impact on babies. And probably most of you are aware of the data around air pollution and prematurity and lower birth weight, which goes very similarly with exposures to, um, to smoking. But at the same time, with these just have some additional things that I don't normally think about when I think about air pollution, like IUGR or growth restriction, um, susceptibility again to preterm birth, even heart defects. 
Um, so I think it's interesting just again, just to recognize that this environment that's around our surround, you know, the fetus as it's developing has a huge impact on what we might see even in the NICU. And this exposure, this air quality exposure, it can continue, and um, especially as we get into adolescent and toddler ages here, um, you can see that there are respiratory death risks as well as other things like reduced lung function, which is going to impact their ability to play sports and to play, um, absences in school, as well as wheezing and even asthma um, incidents, which we'll talk about a little bit more in, at the end. The other kind of final unique feature of a baby versus an adult is that they're politically powerless. And I love this little um, picture of this little one who's at a stroller um, brigade. And this is where moms come together with their kids and try to talk to members of Congress and to government to advocate for better control over, of, over chemicals. And I love what it says, where it says, please be my safe chemical hero. So we know chemicals and plastic, we know that these are all part of, of our day-to-day -day life, but what we want to recognize is that if we can make them safer, and if we can minimize exposures by not using them in certain places, we can actually make, it, make an impact on health for all. Um, so I think it's important that we realize as healthcare professionals, you know, as moms or aunties or concerned citizens, citizens in general, that we have a voice that we want to say that we recognize that these babies we take care of even before they come to the NICU and even for those babies who never make it to the NICU, that, that we want them to have the safest environment possible and, and to realize that, that they have no vote and that for a lot of times, no vote equals no power. So we definitely want to be, be thinking about that. So we're going to talk a little bit more about these routes of exposure and just kind of to um, go a little bit deeper again into kind of the, some of the fetal exposures as well. So basically everything that comes in our body, especially for pregnant moms, um, it can be passed to the baby. And so in the case of cigarette smoke, in the case of pharmaceuticals, legal and illegal substances, um, these all pass to, to the developing baby. And there was a very classic study that was done in 2005 by the Environmental Working Group. And, it, and if you're not familiar with it, it's a really amazing um, report to really watch and to, and to read. And it was called the 10 Americans. And what they found is that they actually took 10 random babies um, from cord from um, cord blood that had been banked here in California, and um, they, they just tested it randomly. So there were no particular family kind of dynamic or particular occupation. It was just all random um, cord blood samples that had been um, taken by Red Cross. And what they found in this, these samples were 287 chemicals. And so, again, linked to things like cancer, neurotoxics, as well as birth defects. And in the, in the United States, birth defects is the biggest killer of all of all our babies of infant mortality. And so we wonder if it isn't some of these extremely harmful exposures that happen even before a baby takes their first breath um, that could be contributing to some of these, these diseases that we see and rates of illness. So what are some of the top dangers that are inside us? Well, we're going to talk through um, through those now. And, and these are just a short list. Um, food, of course, antibiotics that we take, um, that we administer, the risk of drug resistance, as well as tubing and other plasticizers. So these are the um, top silent dangers that we're going to talk about here for the next few minutes. So what can we do? We know that, that the food system is contaminated. And one of the most important things we can do is to eat slow foods. Um, so that means seasonal, local, organic, and whole foods. So what does the, um, why should we opt for these organic foods? And what would be the big deal about choosing them? They're more expensive. Sometimes they're difficult to find. Um, well, I want you to just realize that the USDA seal for organic um, actually means that the food that you're eating has not been irradiated, was not grown using sewage sludge, didn't have synthetic fertilizers, no pesticides, and has not been genetically modified. 
So the USDA stamp of organic really goes beyond pesticides. And I think a lot of times we think, oh, it's just meaning that the food was grown without or was made without pesticides. But it's really a bigger label than that. And um, unfortunately, it's um, the labeling in the United States is not always as great as we'd love it to be. So I want you to not be fooled. Um, if it doesn't have the USDA label, so that little green label that we've all become accustomed to, then you really have to be even more cautious and read your labels. Because the words natural and just organic alone do not mean anything. And it doesn't mean that there is, um, it, it can be that if they put just the word organic on it, it can actually be that there's 1% of organic materials in that food. If it says made with organics, it can, it means that there's 75% or more. And even the USDA label means it's at least 95% organic. Um, and it definitely does still mean that it's non gmo So that's just one thing that you can you can rely on. The um, natural issue is that all of us look for natural items. And unfortunately, that term is completely unregulated and difficult for, um, you know, for for you to, um, to be able to make a decision a good decision. So there are many people in the United States who are advocating for GMOs to be labeled. So I don't have even time to talk about um, whether or not, you know, it's a way bigger conversation than than, um, than this webinar. Uh, but many people are advocating um, for GMOs to be labeled. And so I think that this will continue to be something that we see a lot more of. I want to talk a little bit about antibiotic use in foods. And in the United States, 75% of antibiotics are used in, in a feed animals. And so this is really to um, promote or prevent, I should say, prevent disease in animals that are in confined spaces, um, not necessarily for treatment of diseased animals. So this is just routine use of antibiotics. And the problem, you know, just to give to the, to the animals. And the problem is that many people believe that this is promoting some of our antibiotic resistance that we're, that we're seeing. The other little kind of side note to overuse of antibiotics. And this actually was a, a study that came out a couple years ago, which was looking at the use of antibacterial products, including antibiotics as being one of the, um, mediating factors for amping up our allergy rates that we see in the United States. Um, and we now know we have a huge explosion of asthma and allergies. And this is, um, some people are theorizing, could be to this overuse of antibiotics, not only in human health, but also in the food supply that we're all exposed to. And this is a um, actually from the CDC, which actually looks at the types of allergies and then looking at just basically just showing that over time, uh, especially ras respiratory allergies, you can see that those start pretty low and go higher over towards adolescence. And then skin allergies start high and, and decrease over time. So babies and children being more at risk for skin allergies and then food allergies staying kind of stable um, throughout all the age groups. But definitely we have a huge um, increase. Some people report as much of a 50% increase in allergies. Um, and again, not that anyone's saying conclusively it's this exposure to antibiotics, but certainly um, on the radar for many. So we talked a little bit about food. We talked a little bit about overuse of antibiotics. And now we're going to spend a little time talking about plasticizers and plastics. So one of the problems with plastics is that they all require plasticizers. And so these disrupt the endocrine system. They mimic hormones in the body, and they can even block receptor sites. That's a very big problem. They leach out of products, especially long-term use, which is exactly what we do when we're using products inside the incubators or even the incubators themselves, especially warm, moist, and indwelling. So what are some examples of these endocrine-disrupting plasticizers? Well, again, plasticizers are used to do two things to plastic. So plastic in and of itself is an awesome material because it is moldable, right? We love that we can make it into lots of different things. 
But one of the um, plastic, but when we add plasticizers to plastics, we add that so that it will either harden the plastic or make the plastics more flexible. And so that is, um, you know, if, depending on what you're making, it's a really good thing. Um, BPA or bisphenol A is something that I've talked a lot about in the past and on other webinars, um, but it was actually first created as a hormone replacement pharmaceutical. And they found that it actually didn't work very well for women going through menopause. But then I don't know how they came up with the idea of adding it to plastic, um, but they, they do. And it's actually used to harden plastics. So for many years, it was the plasticizer that was added to um, the number seven plastics to make the um, like water bottles and water jugs like Nalgene's and things like that really hard. Um, so it gives those reusable plastics a lot of substance to them. It's also used in the resin that goes inside um, canned food. So it's what makes the um, food that stays in those cans for several years not taste like metal. Um, so they actually use it in the resin that goes inside there. Unfortunately, over time and with heat, those plasticizers would break away from their plastics or from their resins and would be introduced into the foods and then we would actually consume them. Um, and so because it, it was so, um, it was developed to be an estrogen mimicker, once it's inside the body, it actually acts a lot like um, estrogen does. And this can disrupt hormones, especially developing baby boys, um, and is one of the um, chemicals that has been linked um, and really tightly hypothesized to be the, the, um, the cause for at the rate of breast cancer increasing here in the United States. So BPA, um, as I said, is not so much found anymore. Um, you can pretty much, as you look around, you'll find that everything said BPA free if it's a hard plastic. But it's been a long time coming and you can see that this was very big news in 2011 after, I don't know, I think the third or fourth um, go around here in California to get BPA banned in in baby bottles and so sippy cups, other things that are marketed specifically for kids. Um, so it was really in the beginning a state by state um, ban. Uh, and for the most part, there is still no national or federal regulation on the use of BPA. So some companies are responding. So you see shortly after the, um, the California initiative, you see here Abbott, um, released a press re, re, um, press release saying that September 2011 um, that they had removed BPA from all of the linings of their powdered formula and from their lids of their liquid formula. So some companies are responding, seeing that that this concern is is widespread and trying to do something about it before there's an initiative or a true law. But not all companies are doing that. And so this is actually from the Breast Cancer Fund and from some of their campaigns. And they are showing here just a, a list of the canned foods that have the highest rates of BPA in them. And it, unfortunately, coconut milk, which is one of my favorite things, um, has one of the highest um, rates of that, as well as um, juices, meal replacement drinks, fruit, um, meat, vegetables, meals, especially tomato sauce based meals, which have a lot of acid in them. Um, and you can see that there are pretty high levels of BPA. This is part per billion in kids canned food. So even Annie's homegrown cheesy ravioli has some and SpaghettiOs, um, one of my favorites when I was a little kid, um, one of the lowest and Campbell's Disney princess soups, one of the highest. So these foods that are marketed as healthy, um, healthier, and to kids specifically, having really, really high levels of these toxins in them and definitely making it harder for parents to steer them away from these, these foods. Um, so definitely we're still needing more support and more advocacy in this, this world um, or in this area. So the Breast Cancer Fund, they make it super easy for you. And so I always want to encourage everyone to be an advocate and to use your voice as a medical professional, health professional. And this is just some examples of, of a campaign that they recently had that was cans, not cancer. 
and they have social media campaigns and letter writing. And basically, they make it so easy. All you do is click and put your name and your zip code, and it will send it off for you. Um, but something like like this particular example of Progresso Soup, where basically they're promoting breast cancer awareness with this pink label and saying, you know, donate this lid to help fight breast cancer. But at the same time, the lining of this soup can is filled with BPA and a known toxic, um, known toxin to be responsible for increasing um, breast cancer and found in tumors and all sorts of things like that. So uh, again, just the hypocrisy of, um, of advertising, we, we just never can get away from it. So all of that is great, but what about the NICU, right? So the, where we spend a lot of our time, and I just wanted to kind of have you think about a few of these um, exposures. And when we look at this picture of the NICU, we don't really even, we it just looks like a normal day to us. But if we stop and we start to really think about all of the things that are in this baby's bed, um, we might start to look at it in a different way. So there's the plastic around them in the incubator. There are the leads that are touching them. There's a diaper that may or may not contain chlorine um, made from virgin trees, which you know depletes some of the environmental resources. We see the linens, whether or not they've been washed with um, chemicals, um, a lot of harsh chemicals, sometimes in laundry. We see things on the face. We see the IV. We see the tubing. We see all these things for the environment that are all necessary for us to keep this little one growing and thriving, but also every single one of them a possible route of exposure as well. So bottles, they are everywhere in our NICU, right? So we use them. They are now all plastic. I know when I first started in the NICU, many times our formula bottles at least were glass, um, but everything is plastic now. And luckily they are BPA free, but um, we're not really sure what they're replacing the BPA with. So I think the verdict is still out, but, you know, an unavoidable um, reality of our world. Breast milk storage. Every breast milk storage container that I see, if, unless it's a mom from home who brings in her um, mason jars, um, they're pretty much all plastic. And again, at higher temperatures, those plasticizers, those those things are going to break down and potentially leach into our our milk supply. We all have to reheat breast milk. And so again, heating up that plastic is just an opportunity for more leaching. Um, and then even here, of course, this picture, um, like so many of us do, even the syringes, heating those up. And really, we know very little about uh, what happens to heating syringes and whether or not the percentage of leaching and things that happen from those plastics. The pacifiers, pacifiers are made from plastic. They used to contain a chemical called phthalate that made them flexible. That was a different kind of plasticizer um, that can potentially um, leach out, but teething rings and things like that used to have um, phthalates in them. Um, now these are phthalate free. IV supplies, tapes, adhesives. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the skin. Um, but we just, we have, there's so many things. And the IVs themselves and the tubings, the feeding tubings, um, they all need to be flexible. And those all require plasticizers that can leach into, into our baby. And here's those feeding tubes. We use them all day, every day um, for many of our babies. And now, thankfully, most of them are all DEHP free. So DEHP stands for, the P stands for phthalates. Phthalates is another estrogen disruptor that was a, found in many PVC products, um, similar to this feeding tube. Um, but now most of our products are PVC, or they are still PVC sometimes, but they are at least DEHP free. Um, so now we're seeing more or polyurethanes and other silicone, other types of materials um, getting away from PVC in the NICU, but certainly um, we still see quite a bit. And then of course, the more indwelling a device, the more at risk for absorption there is. So G-tube, Broviax, long-term lines, um, all of those things made from plastics that have the potential for breaking down and for just increasing that body burden. So what can you do? 
I know probably you're feeling like this little munchkin here. Like, what can you do? Oh my gosh, there's so many things that are all around us. Um, the thing you can do is in your unit is you can do a plastics audit. So one of my favorite organizations is called Healthcare Without Harm, and they do a great PVC audit. They have a great audit tool and recommendations for non-PVC alternatives and for plasticizer alternatives. And so there are plasticizers that we know are worse than others so far. So we try to just at least avoid those those known ones and not um, do too much with, with those others. Steward, um, antibiotic stewardship is a really big deal. So we're more than 10 years away from any breakthrough on any new antibiotics. We are having more and more antibiotic resistant more microorganisms in our environment. And so antibiotic stewardship, not only for just the potential for reducing the rates of allergies, but really for you know, all of our public health, um, antibiotic stewardship hasn't really penetrated a lot in the NICU, but it is coming. And if you just do a quick lit search on it, you'll find a few people who are already starting to talk about it. Um, so antibiotic stewardship is a, is a real thing. It's happening in other parts of the hospital. I think because the mortality rate for, for neonatal sepsis is so high that I think we're a little more resistant to really wanting to do that. But probably you've seen the trend already where you know, we used to see every kid on seven days of antibiotics, and now we're on three. And now if the cultures are negative in 24, we're DC. So I think in our own way, we're doing it. But I think that we can be even more aware um, of, of that stewardship. The CDC does every year, like a um, I think it's called Get Smart, the, C the CDC, which is really trying to do public awareness about when to use antibiotics and when to not. Not every ear infection needs an antibiotic. Um, you know, obviously viruses that are for colds, they don't need antibiotics. So just really giving public awareness as to when antibiotics are necessary. And there have been huge shifts in primary care to being more um, responsible for antibiotic usage. Another really big thing for the things that go in us every day is food reform for hospitals. And that is several hours webinar in and of itself. Um, but again, healthcare without harm being one of the best resources for that. But when we think about food in hospitals, we need to think about whether or not we're employing some of those slow techniques I just talked about. Is it seasonal? Is it local? Is it organic? Is it whole? You know, the processed food and sodas and those things, it's a bad example for our patients. It's a, an unfortunate convenience for those of us who get stuck at work and didn't pack our lunch. Um, and there are a lot of initiatives about using less meat, so less meat per day, um, less meat on menus, so meatless Mondays and things like that, and using those cost savings by reducing the meat use um, used by the um, cafeterias. Um, to then be able to purchase better meat, sustainable be um, meat, um, and to make better choices um, for that. So that was all of the in um, for us. And so we'll spend the last few minutes just talking about the things that are on and around us. Um, so I talked earlier about how thin baby skin are and how much thinner it is in an adult skin. So making them much more at risk for absorbing everything that we put on it. The estimates are that about 60% of what we put on our skin is absorbed. And so we want to be aware of, of those potentials when we do apply things to our skin. In 2007, fragrance or perfume um, was named the allergen of the year. Important to also remember that hydration, when we're bathing, that we are opening up all those little cells, that stratum corneum opens up and um, puffs up and actually can we can absorb even more um, than that standard 60%. So perfumes are typically a synthetically created scent and they oftentimes contain phthalates, which I already mentioned as an endocrine disrupt, a disruptor. When we open those pores and we um, have a um, contact, an allergic contact with that, allergic contact dermatitis can ensue. Now, about 25% of all pediatrician visits every year are related to contact dermatitis and skin eruptions in babies and kids. Um, and this can be a painful um, and unpleasant experience. So some of the other things about fragrance, I always love this one. So something stinks and it's not my diaper is um, 
fragrance is in everything. And so fragrance is defined in the United States as a combination of chemicals, can be up to 4,000 different chemicals that give a product its distinct scent. Um, the problem is that not all ingredients have to be listed on the label. So unfortunately, we oftentimes see things um, that are saying unscented, but they really have fragrance added to mask their normal scent. So if you're looking for a, um, a less exposure to fragrance, what the label really needs to say is no fragrance or no perfume added as opposed to unscented because unscented is unregulated. So many times the fragrance ingredients are produced from um, petroleum, from, they can be from raw materials too, it's just very rare. Um, they're usually made in a lab by some sort of chemical synthesis. Um, so they can be seen as your body as not, um, as foreign, as by not, as not natural. And so the number of um, products we use, and especially for babies, um, can be associated again with our body burden. So when we look at lotions and powders and shampoos, this particular study that was um, published in pediatrics in 2008 found that the more products that a mom or dad used or caregiver used on a baby, um, the higher their urinary concentrations of phthalates. And so basically the phthalates is really a marker of the fragrance um, as well as um, as fragrance. So and it's again, the number of products we use, it increases our absorption of those things. And so many of us don't just use one product, we use so many layers of that. Um, so again, just the more we use, we layer that effect. So what about these phthalates? Um, well, there are so many different types of phthalates. I mentioned the DEHP, which used to be um, found in a lot of our IV tubings and OG tubes and IV bags and things. Um, but you can see that it's also found in fragrance. There's DBT, which is found in nail polish, um, also found in fragrances and hairsprays. Um, and also DEP, which is found in hair, more hair and body um, things as well. So it's important to know your phthalates, but in the end, they're all bad for your health. The other um, danger that oftentimes we find in body care products that we put on our skin are preservatives. And so preservatives in and of themselves is not a bad thing. It should be a good thing. And they're really there to minimize microorganism growth. And so one of the ones that has gotten the most attention lately is a um, preservative called Q15 or Quintarnium 15. And so you can see this was dated January 18th of 2014, and Johnson & Johnson had decided and had announced that they were going to remove formaldehyde from its baby shampoo. So it actually has taken all of 2014 and, and through into this year for them to actually execute it, but they announced that they were removing it and that all future um, uh, runs of their, their um, shampoos were going to be without it. Um, so the Q15 is a formaldehyde donator, which means that it was a slow release. So they put a little bit in the baby shampoo so that it would just kill bugs a little tiny bit over time. The problem is that it's very allergenic to many people, as well as just being a potential carcinogen. The other um, preservative that is oftentimes used is paraben. And paraben, very much like BPA, mimics estrogen in our bodies. And so it's unfortunately found in a lot of products, and you can see kind of a short list here. Um, its purpose is to be antifungal, to be used as an antimicrobial and preservative. It causes skin irritation, has been le linked to breast cancer as well, and has been banned already in the EU and in Japan, but not here in the United States. So it has so many names too. If you look at your um, any of your body care products or if you're shopping in the mall and you're just looking for something, if you look on the back, it's almost always the last couple ingredients and there's usually more than one kind of paraben in every product. And the reason that they've done this is because parabens, there, the EPA has said that there is a safe limit to each of these parabens. So they put in the safe limit of one paraben, but then add a second and a third and a fourth paraben.
so that they are not exceeding the limit, but really there is more parabens in there than necessary, or I guess they don't think it's more than necessary, but more than I think is safe. Um, so the question is really, is that safe? So if it has all these different um, components, but their base is still parabens, is this really a good idea? So something that you can do for the products that you use on yourself, or if you're using on kids, um, is you can go to the campaign for Safe Cosmetics, or they also call it the Skin Deep Database, and you can actually search for pretty much any product. I think it's almost 60,000 different products are in, in here. So I actually did a little search of Desitin, because of course Desitin is something that we oftentimes use. And some of the things you'll notice here, um, the active ingredient is zinc oxide, which is awesome as a skin barrier. But then you'll see these inactive ingredients. So these are things that are giving the, um, you know, the product a little more fluff. Um, so you see highlighted here, fragrance, which we just talked about, and parabens um, that are found in are very common product that is used on many, many babies. So again, the top dangers, avoiding perfumes, fragrances, especially synthetically de derived that, that, are, um, can't, that come from petroleum, as well as preservatives. And so we wanna be sure that we're um, thinking about all these things that are just kind of everyday um, potentials to inhibit health. So we don't really have time to talk about in this particular talk about tapes and adhesives and all of that, but just again to just, um, you know, just to think about, you know, minimizing the use. Again, just those um, adhesives are usually made from some sort of petroleum-based product. And so again, there's just always that risk of some absorption um, as well as I haven't even talked about CHG or hand sanitizers. Um, that are on the bait on our hands and we're handling babies. Um, there are some beginning pilot studies of looking for urinary um, and blood markers of those those things that are um, actually being done by University of Maryland. So exciting stuff coming in the future. So adhesives again, just minimizing their use. Um, you know, I think which is just good for skincare in general, but also just kind of in this context, just thinking about all the other potential risk factors of that as well. So what can you do? You can conduct an audit of the skincare products in your home or even in your hospital. You can download the smartphone app, Skin Deep, um, and you can actually start scanning products as you're at the store, maybe selecting them or, or, or just using them in your day-to-day -day life. Um, so there are many um, really great apps that the EWG or the Environmental Working Group have created. So Skin Deep is only one. Um, the Dirty Dozen is a great phone app for looking at foods that have that have um, higher rates of pesticide use. So it's a good little tool that you can look at to look at your exposures as well. So these are all some great ones. And a sun a sunscreen guide. Not that it, we're all thinking about summer yet, but. Um, when it time comes and we're shopping for sunscreens, it's a great buyer's guide there for looking at less toxic um, options. So last but not least, we've talked about in, we've talked about on, and now we're going to talk a few minutes around um, about around. Um, and so I think this is important to think about because when we think about air pollution, I think sometimes we think so much about the outdoor air pollution and places like Beijing and India, which really struggle um, with this this um, air pollution. Um, but really, all of this adds up in the end. This is the United States, but the same across the world. One in 11 kids having asthma. And so we don't exactly know all of the risk factors for this, but it is certainly something that we're all concerned about. Um, there are many health effects of pollution. And so this is pollution that comes, again, maybe from in, on, and around us, um, but things like bacteria and pesticides and particulate matter and volatile organic compounds, which we're going to talk about next, um, all of these things increasing uh, our risk for poor health. And I showed you earlier these risks for um, air pollution and for risks of respiratory disease and even death. Um, so just again, awareness about this, the physical uh, um, environment all the time around us. Um, the World Health Organization has named indoor air pollution, so not outdoor, as responsible for 2.7% of the global burden of disease. So what is around us is so important. There are many people who still cook over fire every day around the world. 
and that 50% of premature deaths can be attributed to indoor air pollution in many of these um, areas of the world. Um, 4.3 million people die each year from exposure to indoor air pollution. So we want to think about maybe not these extremes in our communities, um, but certainly these are public health concerns around the world. So one of the biggest contaminants in our homes and in our hospitals is cleaners. Um, as we know, almost 100,000 chemicals ha are used in different cleaning products and body care products. And only about 2% of them have actually been tested for safety. Um, and even when we look at in our homes, 90% of poisonings occur in our home, many times from cleaners. Um, triclosan got a lot of publicity. Um, it lurks in everything. It's registered as an insecticide. Um, the unfortunate part about kind of some of these hand sanitizers and antibacterial products and the, the um, research around the allergy stuff really points to this, is that unfortunately we kill with these things some of our good bacteria, our normal flora, as well as the bad bacteria. Um, and so oftentimes we need to look for alternatives for these cleaners. I don't know how many times they clean the floors and we have nurses that have to go down to the ER for a breathing treatment. Um, but, you know, it happens in our homes, but it happens at work too. And asthma is a very big deal. And up to 20% of adult asthma is, has been attributed to air quality at work. And so nurses and housekeepers, we're at the front line of that. And that is a, that is a big problem. So one in 11 kids suffer from asthma, asthma, but one in 12 adults do. And so asthma and air quality go hand in hand. Um, so we just need to think about there are greener, quality hospital grade cleaners that can be used and they are less toxic and definitely have been shown in many institutions to decrease um, this rate of occupational exposures. I think one of the kind of interesting things that always comes up um, when, I, when I do talk like this is what about the air quality inside the incubator? Um, I think it's an important thing that we really need to continue to study. And this is just one example of some of the research that's happening. Um, this is actually happening in Texas. And they wanted to look at those volatile organic compounds inside incubators. And they looked at various degrees of humidity, they looked at various degrees of temperature, and to see whether or not there were changes. And what, actually what they found, um, sorry, I thought that the slide was there with the, the numbers, was the over 300% increase as the temperature went from 28 to 37. So a um, massive increase. So we know, again, as these plastics, not just from the actual um, the, the walls of the incubator, but sometimes from the cleaners that are used, that, that off-gassing can continue, even from the mattresses and things like that, for weeks um, and weeks after they have first manufactured and for years after they've been produced. Um, so looking at in the indoor air quality, so not just the NICU itself, but even inside the incubator is becoming a, an even bigger topic as well. So we want to get beyond the physical. And then NICU designs, they talk a lot about the physical, but there's a couple chapters in there that if you haven't looked at it, I would recommend looking at the furnishings and finishes, um, as well as acoustics. So that's, I'm going to wrap up with those. So there are amazing resources out there to think about ways to detox the nursery, um, looking at healthy child, healthy world. Um, every nursery, home nursery, NICU nursery, um, has the potential for being greener. And so they have this great infographic, and I won't read it, um, but just to, to share it with you, and if you're interested to go look for it online, it's great. Pin it on your Pinterest. Um, but the crib, made with formaldehyde from these compressed um, composite wood, um, MDF, um, crib mattresses, paint. Um, this goes to being um, asthmogenic, to being mutagenic. Um, these are things we want to be sure that we're not using um, in the NICU, when we're doing green models, and hope, and gladly the design standards um, help us to have a, a foot to stand on. Baby care products we talked about, toys. So these are just great tools to share with families as they're trying to go greener. Um, things that you can use yourself as well. Um, I know we're running right at the top of the hour, so I'm going to just wrap up with these last couple of slides. Um, one of the final things, and it only gets a small section. Although I know it's a huge section for a lot of us is noise. Um, 
when I did some research for this particular presentation, I read a lot about the WHO report on noise and health. And I think I knew some of this, but I just, it was a really compelling um, report. They looked at noise and cardiovascular disease. They looked at noise and cognitive impairments. They, especially airport noise, um, when they moved airports from one area of the city to the other, they saw declines in cognitive performance. Noise and sleep disturbance, noise, uh, noise and tinnitus and hearing loss, and noise and annoyance, stress, anxiety, anger, depression. I think this is something that is, this is external noise. This is community noise pollution. But I think that we have, we've all talked about noise for a long, a long time in, in the NICU. Um, but it's a, it's a nuisance for sure, but it's also a threat to health. And I think that we don't oftentimes think about that. I mean, if you think about cardiovascular disease, we're talking hyper, hypertension, tachycardia, you know, instability of the autonomic system. Those are the things we think about too in the NICU, um, but also the interference with concentration and communication and some of our, our own as, as professionals in the environment, our own ability to um, do our jobs well. And then for our babies and our families, relaxation and sleep. And so I know that we talk about noise levels and desirable noise levels, but I don't know that we oftentimes think about it in terms of just this huge impact that noise can have on our health. So to wrap up, what can you do next? Well, I think it's important first to have an awareness, an awareness of all these concerns in our environment and think about these different timings of exposures and that these exposures happen over long periods of time and start very early in life. And so how the, these manifest as disease may take years and years to show up, but we do know that there are risks. And so we want to do our best to really, really try to minimize them wherever we can. I love this quote about the precautionary pr principle. We have to learn to live with uncertainties about what we know and what we don't know. So there, the fact that there's no exposure data doesn't mean there's no exposure. And when the fact that there is no scientific as evidence doesn't mean that there's also not an effect. So we need to think about precautionary principles. This is an environmental health philosophy. This is about um, better safe than sorry. And this helps us make the best decisions we can until we have better data um, and based on whatever is the best data that we have now. So for you to get started in your NICU or in your home, this is from an amazing nurse, Anna Gilmore um, Hall, who was one of the first nurses who works with Healthcare Without Harm. Pick a target issue. I talked about a lot today, um, but pick one thing that kind of stood out to you. Begin to educate yourself, do a Google search, watch some YouTube videos, educate others. I know for myself, when I get excited about something, I can't not tell others about it. Begin to strategize about what's possible and investigate with others outside of your, um, you know, committees and really just get going in your facility. Be the champion for the cause. And I always wondered why somebody didn't do something about that thing that bug bugged me. And then I realized that I'm somebody. And all of you out there listening, you're somebody and you can make a difference with this new knowledge um, today and um, hopefully make a difference for your babies and families. So thank you for bearing with me. I know it was a lot of material, but I hope that you um, found a few new little things out and are excited to maybe try it in your unit. Kathy, thank you so much. That was really fabulous information. Just a lot of information, but you touched on so many important things. Um, we want to open up now for questions. So if you have a question for Kathy down in the left-hand side of your screen, you should see a chat box where we've kind of been talking about the phone audio. Um, please type a question in there and we'll do our best in the next five minutes to answer as many questions as we can. Please, Kath, maybe you were so uh, thorough. <laughs> they don't have you are blowing everyone away. I know, now they're all scared. They're like going and looking at their what's on their cosmetics database. They're all downloading their app. <laughs> Here's one thing. What's the simple, most cost-effective change a NICU can make? Wow, that's a great question. I mean, I think that this always comes down to, um, you know, kind of where do you think your costs are, right? So if you can make a cost-effective change, I mean, I think 
even going back to the simplicity of things about going green, you can talk about just recycling, um, reusing, um, going ahead and, and just trying to minimize overuse of products, waste. I think waste is one of the biggest uh, ways that we can save money uh, and be cost effective. Um, there are so many um, layers to, to all of the things I brought up, but I think just beginning to even just have an awareness about one of those things. But I think waste, if I had to pick one thing to try, to go green about. I think waste is still in the hospital is a big deal. While we're waiting to see if anyone else has questions, you know, I personally want to thank Kathy who maybe four years ago I listened to a webinar that she did on this and I got completely freaked out and <laughs> for dandelion time and was you know, we really took that on as a mantra for the company that this was important to us and that we were, you know, mm -hmm. going to move forward trying to find the best ingredients and source the best products that we possibly could. So this has been a real influence on us going forward. And, you know, we started with one little thing at a time. And, again, for any of you that are listening on the evaluation, if you have any other ideas for things that you'd like to see that you think we could do better in the NICU, please write them down in the comments and you know we'll see if there's anything that we as a company might be able to do about it. Um, so Erin, you're asking about a, um, oh, so, so there's two questions, sorry. So certain website to recommend to families. Um, yeah, I think, I think some of the really great um, ones are the ones that I showed you. So the Healthy Child, Healthy World, um, I think the Breast Cancer Fund has done a really nice job with some of their community um, education. Um, also, Environmental Working Group. Those are kind of my top three go-to. Um, Healthy Child, Healthy World. Um, there's actually for professionals, practice, practice green health. Um, but for parents, I think Healthy Child, Healthy World, Environmental Working Group, that's EWG, um, and, um, and probably the Breast Cancer Fund because they pair up really nicely with the EWG. Um, alternatives. Um, yeah, so I mean, to be, just to try to stay in alignment with the, you know, the virtues of CE world, um, I think what I would say is contact Kathy Bush for some alternatives. Well, I was just gonna see if I could answer that question myself. <laughs> we actually came out in the last, I think, three months with something it's called nurturing bomb and you're going to get an offer at the end of this webinar for some free samples it also has zinc oxide which is not toxic to the babies it actually is not absorbed into the skin uh, but the carrier ingredient so when kathy showed you that desitin has the fragrance and has a paraben in it our carrier ingredients are certified organic so it's um you know really safe and awesome for babies uh, so you'll have a chance to get a free sample of that. So um, I think we're ready to move on. Kathy is going to post the link right now for you to go to your um, to go and get the CE. But again, we want to thank you all for listening. Um, I do want to offer today's webinar participants samples of our organic products. We have four skincare products now that are all certified organic and toxin free: a baby wash, a cream, massage oil, and the diaper rash cream. We also have certified organic 24% sucrose solution that comes in orange or purple vials uh, that are all recyclable and in one or two ml sizes. Um, so there's a place in the evaluation form for you to note that if you're interested. So now in order to receive your free CE, you will need to fill out the webinar evaluation. In the chat area, you can click directly on it or once we're finished, you'll be immediately sent to the evaluation form if your firewall allows. At the end of the evaluation form, you'll receive a CE. To receive the CE, you'll have to click on a link to the certificate. Mm -hmm. If you don't have time to fill out the evaluation right now or your hospital has blocked access, you will receive an email within the next few hours or by tomorrow, certainly, with a link to the evaluation as well as a link to the recording and a PDF of all these slides. So many of you have requested that in the past. If you're viewing as a group, you must each log on to the evaluation form to get the CE. So we do, this is our now 22nd webinar that Dandelion Medical um, has produced, so please feel free to visit our website for past uh, webinars. They're still all active and are available for a free CE. And we'll, in two months, we'll be coming out with our next Dandelion webinar. So I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you all for 
listening this morning, and many, many thanks to Kathy Randall for yet another great Dandelion webinar. Thank you all.